Okay, it looks like we have a good number of our attendees here. I want to welcome everybody to the webinar today. My name is Danny Shapiro and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Dr. Latrice Bowman of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Dr. Bowman has a master's in applied mathematics and a doctorate in online education. She has lived in Alaska for about 35 years and enjoys the challenges and experiences that come with living there. Dr. Bowman has been teaching and working at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for a little over 20 years, 14 of those with online and distance education. She has taught almost every undergraduate mathematics course and many of those have been online. We have another very large audience today and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. My colleague, Jennifer O'Brien, uh, one of our course implementation specialists is also joining us in the background of the webinar today. She's here to help answer questions throughout. So please enter those into the Q&A as we go. If you have questions for Dr. Bowman, we'll save those for the end of the presentation. And on that note, I'm excited to hand it over to our presenter. Thank you, Danny. Hi, thank you for attending my presentation today. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about teaching online math courses. Um, and hopefully give you some tips for setting up both synchronous and asynchronous courses using Hawks, Gradescope, and your LMS. And even though I am talking mostly about Hawks, Gradescope, and in our case, Blackboard, um, we have used many other programs um, that can be incorporated into a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so the agenda for this presentation is I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about me, talk a little bit about our university, and then a lot about our distance courses. Um, and again, most of these that I'm talking about are my math courses, but a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about can be put into some of the other disciplines, okay? Um, so as Danny said, um, I have a master's in applied mathematics and a PhD in education with a certification in online learning. Um, I've done many, courses that have satisfied the quality matters. Um, I've been teaching 20 years, actually about 22 years now at UAF, and have been teaching online for about 14 years. Um, many of the math courses that I have taught, as he said, are a lot of the undergraduate. Um, I've done everything from pre-algebra, intermediate algebra, all the way up through linear algebra. Um, and I've also taught some of our teaching seminars for our graduate students online. Okay, that's enough about me. So about UAF. Um, so we have three main campuses in the state and we have seven branch campuses underneath those that reach across the state. And if you look at the map there, we actually have a couple of little satellite campuses here and there and it's, um, Hard to call them satellite campuses because usually it's a person sitting in an office helping students remotely. 89% um, of our student body is undergraduate students. Um, the enrollment is about 8,700. 5,500 of those are in the Fairbanks area. Um, and Fairbanks, if you see, it's this kind of big blue dot in the middle there. Um, uh, we are spread out throughout the state. 68% um, of our undergraduate students are enrolled in one of our eCampus or online courses. Um, our department, so the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, currently has 13 full-time faculty, 37 sections of undergraduate and graduate math and stat classes with 15 of them currently online. All of the 15 are pretty much the core classes um, and a couple of our upper division math classes. Okay. Um, our online courses include students from 14 different countries and five different continents. So most of our students are from our state, but we really do teach online classes to just about everyone. Um, and so part of what that means for our courses is we do have to be aware that not all of our students have the same resources as the students sitting in our classrooms. Um, especially those across our state. Our state is very vast and some of our areas, um, students don't have internet at their house. Um, some of them don't even have cell phone coverage at their house. Um, so some of our courses, we had to be a little careful with what we put in there, okay? Um, so we started doing online classes about 
15 years ago. Um, and the basic structure for our online classes was to make sure that there was equity to the face-to-face -face sections, which meant we wanted the same level of rigor, similar outcomes, similar expectations of the students. We wanted students to have some sort of collaboration like they see in the class. All of our math classes have small group work. Um, and we wanted instructor collaboration, meaning um, even in our asynchronous courses, we don't want it where students just feel like they are on their own. We want our instructors to have some sort of collaboration with the students. Um, and then we wanted to have that similarity of lecture in the class. And we usually do that through video. Um, students are typically graded on daily practice, which is usually through um, some sort of publisher software. Like I said, today I'm going to show you Hawks, um, but we've also used WebAssign, Alex, My Math Lab, Newton. Um, there's all sorts of other ones out there. So whatever you're using, you can probably modify um, what I'm going to show you to do some of this stuff. Um, all of our math classes have written work. Um, and we have combinations or variations of written and online exams in all of our classes. Um, and then lastly, the students are graded on participation, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean in all of these cases, okay? So first I wanna start with student contact. Um, as I said, we wanted to make sure students aren't feeling like they're alone in their online classes, which is something we, we got feedback on the first couple of years we taught online classes. We, we had a lot of students saying, well, the class was fine, I was able to get through it, but I felt like I was on my own, and we really didn't want that. So we started by making sure that there's some required initial contact with the student at the start of the semester. Um, this varies from course to course. Um, we sometimes have faculty who do um, discussion boards where students have to come in and, you know, tell them their name, tell them what the major is, tell them a little bit about their self, and then all of the students um, submit something and respond to other students' comments. Um, like I said, there's all sorts of different types of initial contact. Um, I do a, a required initial contact where the students not only need to meet with me and meet with a tutor, but they also get contact through the, the course software, and I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. Um, throughout the course, we wanted students to make sure they knew that we were still there for them. And so in my classes, I use biweekly check-ins. Um, this is not necessarily me emailing every single student and saying, hey, I saw you didn't turn in this assignment, come you know, meet with me, let's talk about this. It's more of a check-in where I reach out to all of the students and let them know, hey, here's what's coming up. Here's where I think people are doing well and, and having difficulty. Um, here's your chance to contact me and see if there's anything else I can do to help you out. Um, and I do this through Google Mail Merge. Um, basically, partly to save me some time, um, I teach four, classes a semester, um, two to three of those are usually online. And so I've got anywhere from 40 to 100 students online. Um, it would take me forever to reach out to each one of them every two weeks. So um, I try to automate as much things as I can. And I can show you this Google Mail Merge in just a sec. Um, obviously, emails and phone calls. Um, my, my only advice here is make sure you indicate etiquette for these. Um, students tend to email like you're their best friend and sometimes the emails don't always make sense. So I do set up etiquette right at the beginning of the course and say, hey, if you're going to email me, please make sure that you include this information, primarily your name, which course you're in, and give me some in, uh, something about what, what your question is involving. And I try to give students a 24-hour response. That seems quick, but Again, because they're in an online class, I'm not seeing them face to face every day, not necessarily. And so I wanna make sure that I'm not holding them up for moving forward in their work, okay? Um, and then lastly, student appointments. Um, I put in parentheses your office hours. Um, 
we have a lot of faculty in our department who still haven't come on board with my idea of student appointments. Um, but me personally, what I found is when I set my office hours before, I used to say, okay, here are the hours I'm gonna be available to you. And what I found is almost nobody used them. Um, so what I did instead is I set my work hours for my online classes. It's usually 7.30 in the morning to 6.30 at night. And students can make appointments as they need them. Um, I actually found I get more students using this than I had before with my office hours. Um, and so as you can see there, I use You Can Book Me for that. And again, I'll kind of show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna, uh, sorry, my screen. So the first thing I wanted to show you is the Google Mail Merge. Um, and I'm just gonna start with a simple welcome letter. This is basically the welcome letter I send all my students before the semester starts. So the week before we get a list of all our students, usually through our LMS, um, which in this case is Blackboard for us. And I just give them a quick welcome. This just tells them, hey, I'm here. This is who I am. This is when class starts. Here's some things you can do to get ready for the class. Um, and what's gonna be expected you, of you that very first day the semester begins. Um, and as you can see here, I, I've got some templates in here. This is an add-on in Google. So if you use Google, um, it's one of the add-ons you can use. And basically what I do at the beginning of the semester um, is I just pull from my LMS, my student uh, data, and I'll make a spreadsheet out of it. It'll usually include the name of the student, the student's emails, and again, we pull this from the LMS, so it's all their campus emails. Um, and then any other information I'm gonna put in here. So for example, in this welcome letter, I'll put a course title in there and the description of the course. Um, for my biweekly check-ins, I might pull a column out of the grade book. For example, I'll pull out worksheets and then I'll create a if-then statement in the spreadsheet that says, if your worksheet grade is below this, here's the message you're gonna get. If it's between these two values, here's a different message. And it just gives the students an idea of where they're sitting without me actually sending them a grade. Um, I feel they can go into Blackboard and look at their grade. There's a nice grade book in there. I don't need to tell them their grade every week, but I can use those columns to give them some information about the course. Um, and again, this is an easy way to reach out to all my students because it takes me just a couple of minutes to type these up. And I'll be honest, it takes me even less because I reuse them every semester and just change dates where I need to. <laughs> um, but once I have these set up, um, I can simply send this to the emails and merge it and it takes maybe 20 seconds for it to send it to all of my students. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is the You Can Book Me. Um, again, this, is, this works with Google. Um, it also works with some other calendars, um, but basically I can set up, like I said, my availability throughout the week. Um, and right now this is finals week, so I kind of adjusted my hours a little bit because I don't want to be in there when, or available when I'm giving finals um, or presentations. Um, the nice reason I use this with Google is because if I have other appointments that I've got to put into my calendar, um, this will block those out as well. So it does link with Google and it's nice for the student because the student can just go over here and they'll pick a time and then it'll ask the information and you can set up what this asks the students. I ask the students to put in their name, their email, what course they're in and give me a brief description of what they want to talk about in the meeting. And I let the students pick the times that they want to meet. So they can set a 15 minute appointment if they just have a quick question, or they can set it up for an hour if they've got a couple of questions, or maybe they know they're not understanding something in the material, they can set a full hour appointment. Um, and so, like I said, a lot of the faculty are still doing office hours. Some of them still use this to set up their office hours. Um, some have gone to the appointments and found that to be useful. Okay. Sorry, I've got to move this uh, bar out of my way. Um, 
and I'll just kind of briefly show you. So this is what one of the weeks in my, my schedule looks like. You can see I put in some things like my class, my face-to-face -face class. I had my scheduled my time for grading my homework. Um, and then the, most of the rest of that is student appointments. Um, the students book it and then it, it populates right to my calendar. So it makes it very easy for me to see who's coming and I can click on it and find out what they wanted to do. All right, let me go back to this. Sorry, I have too many windows open here. Okay. So for each of the lessons that we do, as I said, we like to try and keep some sort of lecture in there. Um, we do uh, what we call lesson introductions. Um, and so instead of recording a full hour lecture, um, part of this was because, again, a lot of our students have iffy internet. And so waiting five minutes for something to download just doesn't work in parts of Alaska. Um, so we decided to do short videos with a quick intro and one or two examples. Um, and before you get skeptical, I've got a lot of people who have said to me, well, you can't do a math introduction with examples in five to 10 minutes. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> you, you do keep them short. And what that means is some lessons may require multiple videos, but I try to keep them very short, um, partly for student attention span, <laughs> but also because once they look at one of the videos, they can try some problems. If they feel like they've got it, they can keep going. If they feel like they don't, then they can go and use more of the videos as needed. Um, and what I found also is with the short ones, if there is something that students are missing, they're more likely to ask questions. And sometimes it's not necessarily that they're not understanding the material. It's sometimes they just need a, a little push in the right direction. Um, I try to use what I call medium examples for my videos. Um, and what I mean by that is if you open any math textbook, usually in the back, there are some exercises. There are some that are kind of very easy, some kind of middle ground, some that are very hard. I try to do one or two of those medium examples. Um, and that way, when they're in their um, publisher software, whether it's Hawks, WebAssign, et cetera, they can try some of those easier ones as practice on their own. Um, or they can move up. So if they feel like they've got a good handle on it from the videos, then they can go in and um, do some of those harder ones. Um, for Hawks, I encourage students to go through their learn module first. If it's not Hawks that they're dealing with um, and the software doesn't have a uh, tutorial part to it, I tell them to do their reading first and then go back and look at the examples. Okay, um, for our videos, a lot of our videos are done through uh, our eCampus center. So we schedule a time, we go into our eCampus center and they have what they call a light board that we use. Um, if you don't have something like that at your campus, I have also used Zoom, Flipgrid, Kaltura, Camtasia, YouTube. I actually have a whiteboard in my office down the hall and set up a video camera and recorded. Um, there's, there's all sorts of tools out there that you can use. Um, Zoom is nice um, for, for really quick things. If you don't have a quick, uh, a, a nice setup for a camera, um, flip on your Zoom screen and record. It works very easy. Flipgrid is another one that's pretty easy to use. Um, one of the reasons I mentioned fit Flipgrid it is not the most advanced, but what I like is it keeps the videos short. <laughs> um, and our university has Kaltura built into our Blackboard system. Um, and I will say YouTube I used before I started, get, we had some of these other tools. Um, part of why we do these lists and introductions is again, this gives a sense of instructor presence in the course. So even if it's an asynchronous course and you never actually have meetings with the students, this way they can see who you are. Um, I am not saying that I don't use the publisher videos in my course. I love those videos and all of them are posted in my course, but this way the students kind of get a sense of who I am. And 
I emphasize things differently than what you're going to see in some of the Hawks videos. So it's it's nice to have kind of both in there, so students get a little bit more um, a little bit more from the uh, information. Um, so here I want to just kind of quickly show you. So this is the light board I'm talking about. Um, so uh, ours, once we get the videos made, we can post them in Kaltura and then it's we can easily embed them in our um, LMS. So in this case, Blackboard. Um, I don't want to run through the entire video, but you can kind of see um, it's a big board. I can write on it. The students can see me. They can see what I'm saying. And if you notice, uh, like I said, in this case, the, the video is only about five minutes. This one here is about eight minutes. And as I said, I have more than one video in here per, per lesson. Um, I try not to get more than four or five in there because again, five of them at 10 minutes, well, there's a 50 minute lecture. Um, so I, I don't want to go over about five per, per lesson that I'm looking at. But again, I can do some short ones. Um, some of them go together. Um, so like I said, you may have a concept that's a little longer. I would break it up to kind of topics and do a, a quick introduction and, and some examples from that. Okay. All right. So the daily practice that we do um, is usually what we consider our online homework. Um, like I said, we do both online homework and written homework. Um, the online homework usually comes from the publisher site. And here I'm going to talk a little bit about Hawks. Um, I, one of the things that I recommend for people, um, whether this is your first time teaching or you've been teaching for a while, um, set up the due dates early. Um, if at all possible, set them up at the beginning of the semester, especially if you've taught the course before, try to get as much of the material out there for the students early. Um, one of the things I have found is um, you will always have a handful of students that are what I consider the high achievers. And if I am trying to put out a lesson a day or two before I want them to work on it, that is not going to work for a lot of students. Um, most of our students are non-traditional um, and so and one of the other things we, we get a lot of is we have a lot of students that work up on the north slope. What that means is they have two weeks on the slope, two weeks off. When they're on the slope there is absolutely no internet. Um, and so for a lot of our students taking their classes we still have set due dates but we've got to make sure we've got our stuff out far enough so that the students who are going to be gone can still participate in the course. So set your due dates up early. Um, I would say at least a week out. If you can get it further, great, but set it out early enough. Um, if you are going to have late lessons, set up your late lesson penalty early and let your students know it. Um, I will say when I first started teaching, I did not believe in doing any kind of late work. Um, I, I've shifted that a little bit. Um, any of my online homework, I will let students turn in late. And part of why I changed that was I found for these, there's no extra work for me to let them turn it in a day or two later. Um, and so my late lesson penalty basically is a 10% deduction per day. Um, and like I said, it's nothing for me to do that for them. And what I found is I get more students turning in the work, even if it's late. I, you know, more of them are, are, are likely to turn it in um, a little bit later. Um, set up a to-do list or a calendar. Um, some are built into your LMS or your publisher site. So Blackboard, um, I will show you again there. There's a calendar in Blackboard. If you set up your grade center, um, it populates to the calendar. Um, the same is true for Canvas. So for those of you who've used Canvas, if you've got um, your grade book set up or you've got due dates put in there, it will automatically populate to your calendar. Um, for the publisher sites, um, Hawks actually has a nice to-do list for students. Um, I know WebAssign, it just shows up in their, um, their weekly calendar, but something to let them know what's expected of them later on in that week. Um, this fourth 
statement is probably one of the things I tell most people when they come to me for help setting up their classes. And that is try not to overload the students. One of the biggest misconceptions students have about online math classes is they're gonna be just as nice as the ones in person or easier because it's online and I've got all the resources there. And it's actually just the opposite. It is going to take students more time online to do this class than what they did in the face to face. Um, I'm very lucky. I often get to teach my face to face and online of the same class at least one of those courses every semester. So I, I can easily make my classes very similar and I get to see those differences. Um, all I mean by this is when you're setting up the course. Think about what you would do if this was being taught in the traditional sense. So for example, some of our three credit classes meet three days a week for an hour. Um, we give them you know, assignments only on those days or we assign it on the off days, but we don't assign five days a week of homework if they don't meet five days a week. Um, for our four credit classes, some meet four or five days a week, same idea. So in my online class, if I've got a three credit class, I try to keep everything Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and I don't give them extra stuff on those other days. That's not to say I don't expect them to look at it or go in and do stuff, um, but I'm not gonna assign things and ex you know, make it required that they work on those off days. Um, and that keeps the workload similar to that traditional class. And I found more of my students are, are much happier with that <laughs> and actually get through the course. Um, use reviews or just in time material for extra credit. So this is primarily if you are not already doing like a co-requisite course. Um, a lot of the publisher sites have built in chapter reviews or they've got um, what they call the pre-material. Um, this is very easy extra credit for students. Um, and I don't put due dates on these. I just say, hey, if you've done this by the end of the semester, it's great if you do it at a certain time because it's only going to help you. But if you've done it by the end of the semester, you get a little bit of extra credit for it. Um, and that's typically for my lower level, so the 100 level uh, classes. I don't usually do that for my 300 level. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, um, again, this is more specific to Hawks, but there are some other um, publisher sites that do this as well, and that's the assignment reviewer. If you have a way to go back in and look at snapshots of your class, use that to help guide review sessions, or if you're teaching synchronously, use part of that synchronous time to, to go over the stuff that the students have missed. Um, I'm gonna kind of look at a couple of things here. So um, I am going to jump into my Hawks class very quickly here, maybe. <laughs> this is the only one I didn't set up ahead of time because I knew my internet would lock me out of it. <laughs> um, so a couple of things I had talked about, um, uh, for those who have never used Hawks or are not using Hawks, I apologize for this session, the section. Um, like I said, there's similar things in WebAssign and Alex um, uh, and in my math lab. Um, for those who use Hawks, um, here's where you can set up your late lesson penalty. Um, and like I said, you can decide how you want to do it, whether it's graduated um, or fixed, or if you want to do a percentage or by points and how many days. And so like I said, for, for mine, I set it up with a 10%, well, it kind of doubles, a 10% deduction, and then the max they can lose is 50%. So if they turn in that daily practice, they're still gonna get some sort of credit. Um, the student to-do list, um, like I said, um, in my Blackboard course, they, they get this as well. But uh, again, I, I like in Hawks that you can break it up however you want and it shows them everything that's due. So my courses, I usually do uh, set up the modules weekly. So each week they'll get an announcement and it'll tell them, hey, this is what you're gonna be working on this week. And then in, in their Hawks and in Blackboard, they can see exactly what's due. 
Um, the other thing in here that I want to quickly show is the assignment reviewer. Um, and as I said, it's a good snapshot of kind of what's going on in your class. Um, and I want to pick a particular one. Uh, I want to pick this assignment because, again, what I can do with this is I've already assigned these, the students have done them. What I can look at is how well the students are doing. And so if I have a review session coming up or even my synchronous session coming up, I can say, oh, well, this is a problem that a lot of the students missed. What did it look like? And it can show me what that problem looks like and I can get an idea of what to cover in that review session. It makes it very easy to do quick review sessions. And sometimes in my synchronous classes, like I said, I'll use a portion of that synchronous time. I'll pull up this assignment reviewer and go through the problems with the students. Um, uh, for some of the review sessions, um, if we're not meeting synchronously, what I will do is pull these up. And again, I can use Zoom to do a quick video for the students and say, okay, here are some of the types of problems that a lot of the students were missing or didn't get full credit on. Let's go through this real quick. And so I'll walk them through how to go about looking at things and solving things. Um, the only other thing in Hawks that I want to mention in here, um, which is another thing that I, I, I like to use is in their reports. So in the detailed student grades, and I'm not going to pull this up because I don't have a dummy sheet and I don't want to give you guys my student information, but in here, uh, this is one of those things I use in those synchronous sessions that the students set up. So those student appointments. Um, if a student makes an appointment with me and one of their questions, which is one that I get all the time is, how am I doing? How do I improve my grade? This is one of the first places I will go. I'll pull up the detailed student grade and pull up that student. And it will give me a snapshot of what um, the student's grades look like. Now, this one I can do because I have an account in here. And I will tell you, I'm an awesome student because I've done everything one time. Um, but it'll give you basically everything that student has done. Um, and it's color coded. So when I look at this and I see green, like I said, I'm, I'm a really good student right now. Um, but it also has blue and yellow. So yellow tells me that the student turns something in late. Um, blue means they haven't done it yet. And if their bar, so where it's kind of gray and white, if that bar is orange, it tells me they're overdue with something. So this gives me a great easy snapshot of seeing what the student has done and gives a great conversation starter for them. So when they tell me, hey, I've been working really hard and I don't know why I'm getting a, a poor grade and I pull this up and I see a whole bunch of orange, I can say, well, part of it is, you know, you haven't done anything in Hawks. Let's, let's look at that. <laughs> so um, again, there's some nice things in here that you can use to, to help um, get information on where your students are. Um, the other thing I wanted to show under uh, this kind of daily work, um, all of your uh, LMS systems have some sort of menu. All of the publisher sites, well, their sites, they have a website. One of the things I recommend is um, if you don't have an LTI integration built into your LMS, put a link in your course for whatever they're using. Um, and make it easy for the students to find. Um, again, depending on the level of the course, I might do this differently. Um, I've had it in the past where some of my courses, there's a link right in that day and it says, hey, click here to get into your homework and do your homework. Um, most of the ones that are, are not a first semester course, I'll just put the link in the, uh, in the menu. I think I showed all of that. Let's go to the next slide. 
All right, written assignments. So these next two things I'm gonna talk about, I would say when we had the COVID-19 um, uh, push to move everything onto, uh, online, faculty in my department who had never taught online, these were the two biggest questions we had were, well, I've never done an online course, how do I get my written assignments online? Um, I will say uh, when I first started teaching online, I used uh, email. So students were allowed to just write out their problems on paper and somehow they had to figure out how to digitize it and then they would email it to me. Um, I would say that lasted half a semester. Um, like I said, I've got about 100 students a semester online and getting 100 emails with attachments that I've got to pull out and download, th that was just not worth the time. It was more of a headache than it was worth. So then I started using Blackboard and Canvas. Um, and I say both of these because our institution actually uses both LMSs. Um, Blackboard is the main one, but we also do some of our online courses through Canvas. Um, those, it made it a little easier because I wasn't have to weed it through and pull out all of the documents from the students. Um, but I will say I was not a fan of being able to grade them. Um, both have their own built-in grading tool, um, but when I grade math homework, I like to grade all of the same problem at the same time um, and then move to the next problem. So if I've got 20 students turning an assignment or 40 students turning an assignment, um, if you're looking at PDFs, that is really hard to get to the same problem quickly and efficiently grade that. Um, it's doable. Um, I will say for about eight years, that's how I graded their homework. Um, and like I said, I wasn't a fan of the, the tools in Blackboard or in Canvas. So what I was doing was I was downloading those PDFs and I'd open them up in a PDF editor and grade it. And oh my goodness, again, I will never go back to that. <laughs> so um, I am gonna do a little plug here. I am gonna mention Gradescope. Um, now what happens is we assign our homework, the students upload their assignments into Gradescope, I go into Gradescope and I can grade their assignments. And this makes it easy because even though the students are submitting a PDF, it is giving me one problem at a time. So I can grade all of the same problem at the same time and I can make things a little bit uniform. Um, and I'll kind of talk about what I mean by that. Um, so Gradescope provides students with an assign, or basically I provide students with an assignment through the LMS or the publisher site. So I can put it in Hawks and I can put it in Blackboard um, and let the students get their um, assignment. They download it. Um, what does that mean? Some students have printers, some don't. Like I said, some of our students are in a place where they can't print things off or they don't have great service. So what that means is they can download the PDF to their uh, computer and write out their solutions on their own paper. Um, for students who do have printers, usually they'll print it out and write, the, uh, um, write their work on the PDF. Um, and I say that for some of our classes, some of our classes, we are still doing book problems. And so they're just pulling, you know, the uh, homework from the book and writing it out on their own paper. Um, LMS and the Gradescope are linked. So you can link your LMS to Gradescope. And what that means is students have a single sign on login. Um, it also means that I can push grades back to Blackboard. I don't have to download something to a, a spreadsheet and then upload it again into Blackboard. I can just push them over, uh, just like with the publisher sites. Um, Gradescope makes it easy for students to digitize work. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, students, if they've got a smartphone, so like I said, a lot of our students don't have printers or scanners. If you've got a smartphone, they can easily take pictures and upload their work. Um, if they don't and they've got a camera, I've got some students who use a digital camera and just upload their work that way. Um, it's very versatile. Um, my students, I actually have them all get a Dropbox account um, and then they use their Dropbox app on the phone because that one will actually let them take pictures and merge it into a single PDF. Um, and then grading uniformly, like I said, it makes it easy for me to grade uniformly. 
one of the things I used to hate with my paper and pencil classes was I'd get this stack of papers and I'd be grading and I'd see the same mistake over and over and I'd have to write the same comment like 50 times. And then I'd realize, oh, Mm, well, let me give a half point back for that because they're not technically, eh, but then you got to go back through all the papers and add that half point. Um, here, I can do that with one click. I don't have to go back through all 50 papers. Um, like I said, it'll upload grades back into your LMS and it sends a correspondence about the assignment. So you have that option. It's, it's not automatic, but you have an option to send out an email at the end of when you're done grading. And what's nice about that is you can customize that to the assignment. So again, I'll show you this, but I can say, oh, you know, here's the, here's your link. This has been graded. Go in and review your work. And by the way, on problem seven, this was a common error I saw for everybody. Um, the other things I like about Gradescope is students can easily review their graded work. Um, and that doesn't seem like such a big thing, but when <laughs> You look at the next line, it's time stamped, accessible, and easy for students to review. Um, a lot of students, when they got paper assignments back, they'd stick it in their folder. Some would lose them, some would throw them away. This way, all of their graded assignments are in one place, and they have access to it as long as they can log into that account. Okay. Um, let me take you over to Gradescope real quick. Um, so the first thing I want to say about Gradescope is it does have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lot of universities have already signed up for this. So if your university is in here, then you can easily sign up for an account. And if it isn't, unfortunately, like most things, you do have to pay for it. I think with the COVID-19 right now, they are doing uh, uh, free access, kind of like most of the um, publishers are doing. Um, but it's uh, pretty easy to set up too. Once you're in here and you can see I've, I've used this for a while, um, you can set up a course literally to create a course. You put in the name of the course, give it a description, put in the semester you want to use it and create it. Um, you can use an entry code just like most of the um, like web assign and things like that where you can give the students a code to get in. But again, you can also just link it to your, your, your LMS. Um, in here, and I'm going to pick this one. So as you can see, I've got my summer course kind of set up, um, to create assignments. There's two ways you can do this. Um, like I said, in some cases you may want, um, a PDF for the students where things are kind of templated. Okay. Um, and so here's an example of what that looks like. Um, Basically, when you get in here, you'll be asked to give it a name. You're going to upload a copy of that template, whatever that template is, set the due date for it, mark that it's templated, and then you can decide how you want to grade it, whether you want it to be positive scoring or negative scoring, meaning are you adding points for them to get their grade or taking them away? It's up to you, and you can change this later. Um, and then whether or not you want them to see all of the rubric items or only the ones that are applied to them. Um, I will say I do this both ways. For their homework, I usually show them all of the rubric items because what I'll do is I'll give them the solution and then deduct points for whatever the deductions are. Um, but that way they can see the entire solution and then what they missed. Um, for exams, I would probably only show the applied. And usually what that is is I'll just say, see comments and I'll show them the comments. And so for the template, um, I will say this is where I probably spend the second most amount of work in here is setting up all the templates. Um, and that's because I have templated assignments. Um, you don't have to have templated assignments and I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, but basically I'll, I'll set up the PDF and this is something I just type up in LaTeX um, and then put it in. And over here you can see I've got what the, um, you know, a short description of what the problems are and what the points are. Once you save the outline, it's in there for the student to see, okay? Um, and here you can kind of see, this is what it's gonna look like when you go to grade it. Um, 
you'll notice the manage subscriptions is already, um, or submissions is kind of already checked off. I kind of went over that because that's where you're going to see all of your student names who have su submitted something and the timestamp when they submitted it. Um, this is where you can start grading. Um, and I will say I am, I probably am not using this to the best of its ability because they do have a built in, um, uh, I, I don't know what the word, an AI, a built in AI. And you can see I kind of uploaded my own solutions in here um, just so you could see what the grading looks like on this. Um, but one of the one of the things that it'll do when you first come in is it'll let you group us, you know, group problems together based on what the students answered. Um, you can do that. Me, I just go through and grade it individually. But what that means is I can come over here and actually set up my rubric. It's always going to have the default in there, the points that are there based on that template you set up. And like I said, it is um, it does work with LaTeX. So now you can see me kind of very slowly type in here. <laughs> uh, so you can put in here whatever you want. Um, it doesn't have to be oh, uh, a LaTeX um, item. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, even a problem. You can actually type in here Miss property. Again, you can see my quick typing when I'm nervous. Uh, Miss property and then deduct or add points. Um, and once you click on it, uh, in this case, sorry, I, I used the positive scoring, so I should probably put a plus two there. Um, it'll automatically add up the points. And like I said, when you switch to the next student, um, you can either take, you know, it'll, once you've built the rubric, you can click on the things that you want to add into what that student got. Um, I'm going to unclick that for now. Um, this is all under the grading submissions. You can go back and forth. You can zoom in and out. You can make comments on here. So I can actually write on here. Um, I can also type things in here. Um, so you have options to how you want to grade it. It's, uh, like I said, it's still grading on a PDF, but it's a little nicer than, you know, going to 30 different PDFs, because then I can just arrow through them when I have more students in here. Okay. Um, again, I'm the only student in this course. Bob Bowman is actually my alter ego. Um, in here, once you're done, like I said, I can post the grades into Blackboard. That'll just push the grades over to Blackboard so I don't have to, you know, like I said, download a spreadsheet or anything. Um, there are some other things. You can export the submissions, export the evals, meaning the grading. Um, you can download the grades. So if you are looking to put them somewhere other than the LMS, um, there are other things you can do with it. Um, once you publish the grades, this is where you can compose the email to the students. And so, like I said, in here, I can customize this. What I like is it'll automatically pull up the statistics for that assignment, so I don't have to calculate them and send them out. Um, but I can edit this and put in a note. So again, see problem seven. Um, or whatever the comment is, I can put in there. I can also put reminders to students, which I've done. So if this homework is right before the next exam, I might give them some information about the homework assignment and then skip down and say, and don't forget to study for the exam that's coming up on Monday. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's all I need. Oh, so the other thing in here that I was going to show you is if you don't have a PDF, so if you are signing problems out of the textbook um, or, I don't know, I, I don't really assign any out of the textbook, but I'm going to show you uh, what that one looks like. And so in this case, when I set it up, I'm still going to put in the name. I'm still going to have to upload a PDF of something, and I'll show you what that looks like here. Um, but I'm going to check the variable length submission. And this just means that when students are uploading their own pages, you might have some students that fit all their work on four pages and someone else fit it all on nine. Um, 
that's fine. They're still going to be able to upload and still be able to show you where their problems are. Okay. Um, so here, same uh, scoring things as before. Um, when I get to the outline, so for example here, and as you can see, this says midterm three. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the exams. Um, and so this is one of the things I've done where my students uh, for their exam, I'm not going to put the actual exam in here because students can upload multiple times. Um, Gradescope is working on that. After the COVID-19, they're, they're making some changes to their, their platform. But what I've done is, again, I'll put the exam in my LMS, and then they come here to upload it. Um, and again, I can set up the, you know, what I want here. This can be set up at any time. I, I, I don't have to put anything under this title until I'm ready to. So if you don't want students to see anything in here, you can upload a blank PDF, <laughs> save the outline, and, and you're good, okay? I'll talk a little bit more about the exams, but I figure I should do that as we get into the presentation. So this, um, for exams, <clears throat> Uh, there's four options for exams. I put proctored versus unproctored, but really you've got about four different types. Um, there's the online um, and written. Online proctored, you can use any of the uh, thing. There's lots of tools out there. Respondus and RP Now are two that I know of. Um, our Respondus is usually in some of the publisher sites. RP Now is one of those that you got to buy a school license for. Um, I will say I know our school uses RP now and it charges students like $10 per exam. So I'm not really a fan of that, but it's, it's an option and I know different schools do it differently. Um, there's online unproctored. Um, these I usually use for practice or review. Um, you can make them timed or not timed. There's, you can do single or multiple attempts. So if I'm doing like a, a review, I might allow them unlimited attempts and they can go in and it'll um, regenerate the problems. Um, and these can be found pretty much everywhere. They're in your Blackboard system or Canvas. Um, they're in the publisher sites. So Hawks has some web tests in there that you can do. WebAssign I know has some that you can build. Um, Alex definitely has them. I mean, they're, they're pretty much in all of the sites. Gradescope even has an option for that now as well. Um, the difference between these is um, your online proctored, usually the students are going to have their webcam, they're going to show you the space, and the webcam stays on while they take the exam. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an online exam, but it can be. Um, that online, like Respondus, that's a web browser blocker. So when the students start the exam, they can't open other websites and things like that. RP Now, we've used that for written exams as well as online. Um, and like I said, they're just using their webcam. For the written exams, proctored and unproctored, um, I would say before COVID-19, all of our written exams were proctored. Students set up their proctors in the first week. Um, we work uh, with our eCampus. eCampus will send out instructions to all the proctors and kind of vet them, make sure they're not related to the student and things like that. Um, and then we set up dates and reminders. Um, my only caution for this is beware of students' costs because um, some students are in a place where they can get to a testing center at their local college or university and they're not going to be charged. Um, sometimes if they're not a student there, they can be charged anywhere from $45 upward um, per exam. Um, I've also had students who use like local libraries for their proctors and things like that. Um, again, just be aware, be aware of the cost. Um, for the written unproctored, this is what we've been doing since COVID-19 um, because all of our our proctoring center on campus pretty much shut down and we were told we're not allowed to have proctored exams anymore because students can't go to the centers. So what we've done is we're doing timed exams. So kind of like what you saw, um, we'll post them in Blackboard and I can show you in Blackboard how we do that. Um, we look at when they downloaded the assignment 
And then, like I said, when they upload it in Gradescope, we get a timestamp so we know exactly how long they took on the exam. Um, and we do tell them, hey, if you go over the time limit, you're gonna get a, a penalty, a per, per percentage taken off. Um, and we make concise instructions for the students that pretty much show up the week before the exam. So for example, um, obviously this, well, I shouldn't say obviously, this week is our final exams. And so last week, um, students got these messages, hey, set aside some time to study for your final. Um, you know, you're gonna find it in Blackboard at 2 a.m. Once you download it, you have this amount of time. Um, make sure you submit it in Gradescope. And then we lay out the deduction right there so that they know. And so one of my classes is doing their final today. Um, basically, we put the information in there again, and there's a link. And one of the things we did, Blackboard does this nicely. I know Canvas does it as well. I don't know about L other LMSs, but you can set the tracking on this. And what that means is I can open up a view of who downloaded this when. I'm gonna, uh, I guess I shouldn't show you all that. Um, but it gives me the student names, and it tells me exactly when they downloaded it. And I can uh, then go into the grade scope and when they submit, I can see the time difference. Um, it is not a perfect system, but it does give us a way to um, uh, at least give timed exams when we're not right then and there. Um, part of that is we did also reword some of the questions. Um, so normally we would you know, just ask students to solve this equation, find this derivative, maybe show me on a graph how this explains something. Um, we do a lot more where they have to do more writing on them now. So instead of just solving the equation, walk me through the steps and explain why you chose those steps as opposed to some other method. Um, when you're taking this derivative, why are you using the product rule as opposed to the quotient? And is there a difference to that? Um, things like that. So making them actually explain the things out a little bit more. All right. I realize I, I actually get talking very much. I, I know we're getting close to time. This is the last slide, which is participation. Um, basically, this was the last portion of our grade for a lot of our online classes. Um, and participation comes in different ways. Part of it is making sure students are logging in regularly, whether it's in the LMS or the publisher site. If we're doing synchronous classes, making sure they're attending class sessions. Um, like I said, some classes do discussion posts, um, I should say discussions, some do student posts where students use Flipgrid or Blackboard or something to explain a concept or ask a question and respond to someone else's question. Um, we do a lot of those where um, students can uh, kind of collaborate with each other asynchronously. Um, we also have the small group discussions synchronously. So using like Zoom and the breakout rooms, we can do group collaborations. Um, we do synchronous reviews, so students can attend um, reviews and get some participation points. Um, for asynchronous classes, we also do things like uh, those biweekly check-ins. You have to respond to four of them during the semester to get some participation points. Or you have to attend X number of tutoring appointments um, or X number instructor appointments. Again, they get to set those up. So um, just throughout the semester, attend four of these. There's your participation. So there's different things you can do there for that. Um, uh, but again, this is not all of what you can do. There's all sorts of other things out there. This is just some of the stuff we've done in the past. Okay. I apologize for like just going, but whew, questions. <laughs> that was great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. Um, yeah, you covered an amazing amount of topics. Um, I, we've gotten questions on a lot of it. I, um, we have a few instructors commenting that they're off to uh, run to their three o'clock class. Um, <laughs> but I do want to try to address some of the questions. I know you said you had a little bit of time beyond three o'clock. So if our audience is able to stick with us, um, we'll try to get to some of the big things that were asked. Um, number one is we had some questions on how do you meet face-to-face -face for those appointments that your students book with you? 
um, what is the platform you're then using to connect with them? That's a great question. So I will say I started using Blackboard Collaborate when we didn't have Zoom. Um, so our university just got a site license for Zoom a year ago. Um, before that, I was using Blackboard Collaborate. And when I was using Canvas, uh, I think it's called Big Blue Button. Um, we have some instructors who are using Google Hangouts. Um, what I would recommend is anything that's got a whiteboard, a chat feature, and ability to share screens. Um, any, if you've got a platform that does that, that's probably good enough. Um, Cause usually those sessions are students asking me questions on their homework or asking questions about what they're doing in Hawks. And so if they can share their screen with me or I can share a whiteboard with them, then it's, it's, it's easy to communicate with them easily. And we have some other questions about the whiteboard. Um, and just some instructors who are not familiar with those um, and had some questions there. Can you kind of just describe that um, and then also talk about, um, we had some questions on what you do as far as closed captioning and ADA compliance and how that plays in. Um, so I'm gonna be honest and just say, we have a great eCampus center. <laughs> So our eCampus, um, basically they got a grant to get this light board. It's basically a big clear, it looks like a big glass screen, but it's got light that comes up. And so what it does is when you're recording through it, it reflects so that I can just write on it and students can kind of see what I'm writing. Okay, I'm going to play a little bit of this video. I, I'm just going to play it. Um, and they, they actually do a lot of the work for me, um, meaning they have a captioning person there for me. Um, they actually edit this for me. So when I'm sitting there and I make all sorts of silly mistakes, they cut all that out for me. Oh, I sorry, I don't have my volume on for that, but that's okay, y'all don't need to really hear me. But basically, I go into the studio, I kind of set up my board, and then I explain whatever I'm talking about, like I said, a quick introduction to it. And then um, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit so you can actually see me writing on this. Um, but I can write, and my students love this. They're like, how did you learn to write backwards? And I'm like, eh, I, it's cool, but I'm, I'm not really writing backwards. <laughs> I'm just writing normally. It's the light board that reflects it correctly. Um, and of course, now it doesn't wanna load, so I apologize. But yeah, that's, that's the light board. Um, and like I said, if you keep the sessions quick, it's a little less editing to do for them, which I think they're probably thankful for because I have videos in about 15 different courses for all of the different sections. And so it's, <laughs> it's a, lot of, a lot of little videos. Okay, that's just not gonna load anymore. I apologize. Um, that would be my, my internet. <laughs> For, um, for grade scope, we had mm -hmm. a question on if, um, if that is ADA compliant and how um, that works. And then also if you're able to provide individualized comments in addition to the rubric that you've set up. Yes, um, I, 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 I can't show you a whole lot on there because I, like I said, all of my classes have the student stuff on there, um, but <clears throat> That'll give me a zero in this position. And if I oh, look at now it's using playing. That pivot Sorry. with the third column, <laughs> I can think plus. <laughs> All right, let me go back here. So yeah, I have one where I uploaded something for me. But um, yes, in here when you're grading these, you can definitely write on them. Um, most of our faculty are using some sort of tablet. Um, I know there's the iPads and everything like that. I am a, I'm definitely a Windows girl, and so I have a Surface Pro. Um, I've got a pen, and usually when I grade these, um, honestly, I've got the keyboard. You use probably four or five numbers, four or five letters, depending on how big your rubric is. Because um, once you have these set up, so every time I add a rubric item, the number's there. I can just hit the number on the, oops hit the number on the keyboard and that will enter that one in. And then 
like I said, you've got extra tools up here where you can write things. So I can circle where someone went wrong, cross things out. And I can also type on here if I don't prefer, if I prefer not to write it out. Um, so it gives you a little bit of um, flexibility in how you want to do it. Um, I've seen some of our faculty who their rubric, all it says is minus two C comments, minus three C comments, and they just click which one they're taking the points off. And then they do all their commenting over there. So it's, it's flexible in how you want to use it. Okay, thank you. And next question is um, wondering a little bit more about your course structure, um, both what's your average class size and then also how long are your terms? Are they shorter or are they the traditional 15 weeks? So we do 15 weeks for the fall and spring and I often teach in summer, which is a 12 week session. Um, and then our class sizes for the fall and spring, we usually cap them at 35. Um, sometimes we go over that. So I would say my pre-calc class, we often have more than 35 students um, coming in because that's a popular one. Um, but like calculus one, it's usually capped at 35 and we try not to go over that because we do do synchronous sessions. Um, and in the summer, um, those are much smaller. I would say we probably get around 15 to 20 students per section in the summer. And we had another question. Um, if, wondering if you are familiar with anything um, that allows students to draw graphs online um, or easily show the steps in solving equations um, or verifying trig identities. They said they've looked around, they can't find anything, and wondering if you might have something. So, um, my, my short answer is there's not a whole lot out there. <laughs> The, the longer answer is this is partly why we still do a lot of written homework um, because I have, we haven't found a lot of good tools where students can do that online. Um, most of the platforms that I've seen, and like I said, I've, I've used a lot of them. Most of them, when they get to the graphing problem, it says, here's the graph, choose A, B, C, or D. Um, or there are some like Alex, which will have them do a little bit of graphing, but once you get into the more advanced graphing, they're back to picking. And so that's partly why we've done a lot of, we haven't gone away from any written assignments because that's where we're going to see, can they really graph something? Can they, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and for the and, verifying identity, same thing. <laughs> and Hawks does have some, have some neat interactive um, graphing mm -hmm. capabilities, which not everyone uses, of course. Um, but if you would want, someone would, of course, be more than willing. If anyone's interested in our graphing, um, one of our uh, courseware specialists would be happy to walk you through everything that our system can do there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, next series of questions is wondering a little bit about um, cheating and some of the um, apps. Someone specifically mentioned Wolfram Alpha. How do you deal with those? So like I said, for, for the homework, I, I, I think I am less worried about it. Um, I can honestly say I, for a lot of my classes, I don't have students cheating. I, and I say that confidently because I still get really varying grades <laughs> on assignments. So when you're grading them, um, and you see some, you know, you see the, the spread of the grades very differently, you know, they're, they're not just plugging in the answer. Um, uh, part of that, I think, is um, just setting the expectations for the student. I know that sounds very trivial, but um, a lot of the course, I tell the students, hey, you're going to be graded on this, this, and this. Um, I don't accept decimal answers. Okay. Um, when they give me, an, uh, except for when we get to application problems, but for a lot of the stuff, like for example, in this problem, they have to leave their answer as a simplified fraction. They have to um, give me certain steps. And when they go through the rubric, they can see that. And I tell them right out when we're doing those videos, I tell them, hey, this is a step that you're going to need to have in there. This is, you know, how you're going to be expected to leave your answer. Um, in the syllabus that they get, there's a page that tells them what the written assignment expectations are. Um, I, would, I would say 
for the 14 years I've been teaching online, I have not had a problem with students giving me perfect assignments <laughs> or things that I don't expect that they are actually working on. Um, I will say that the timed written exams are new. Um, I don't have a sense right now whether those are uh, as good as what I saw with the written homework. And I say those are new because we've only started doing the written timed exams since COVID-19 started. Uh, like I said, before that, they were all proctored written exams. So we, we didn't have a problem with that. Can you talk at all um, about the sense of community between students? You mentioned the small group discussions that you're doing on Zoom. Um, how does that how, do, how are those implemented and is there anything else you do to create a community between the students? Um, so I think for my classes in particular, it starts with their introduction assignment. So uh, the first assignment, like I said, um, I do a quick discussion where they've got to tell a little bit about themselves. It can be something funny, it can be straightforward, you know, what I'm doing, taking classes, whatever. Um, and then they've got a comment to other students. And usually once a week, um, this is for the synchronous sessions, I will say. Usually once a week, we have a synchronous session. Um, like I said, some of them, we actually meet three times a week. Um, but part of those is doing small group work. And like I said, we use Zoom right now. Like we've done it before with Blackboard Collaborate. We put them in breakout rooms. Um, and part of the breakout rooms is I'm not assigning the groups. They're kind of just randomly assigned. So students do get a chance to kind of meet with the other students in there and get a, a feel for them. And we always start, we always try to keep the assignments in those group collaborations small, but easy for them to discuss stuff. So it's not like, oh, you're just all in the same room working on a problem. It's y'all are all in the room and y'all actually have to kind of talk <laughs> and get to know each other a little bit. And then the next week we're gonna do something a little different and you're gonna be with different people. So it's not like they just get one small group in there and form a click. Do you experience the students struggling with technology, whether it's Zoom or any of the other grade scope or, or any, any of the other um, things you use throughout your course? Not as much anymore. Um, I would say the first couple years I taught, it was kind of a slow learning curve. Usually by the fourth week of class, everybody kind of got into the groove of things. Now it's a little quicker, but I think now it's a little quicker because I require that initial appointment with the students. So within the first three weeks of class, every one of my students has to meet with me. Like I said, there are 15 minute appointments, but what we do in those 15 minutes is you know, one of the first questions I ask them is, you know, how is it going? Have you been able to get into Gradescope? Have you gotten into this? Have you figured out how to upload your work? And um, in there, we, we kind of talk about any issues they're having. Um, the other side of that is um, in all of our courses, um, we have a link that goes to either an about this course or a begin here. And in there, it's got a copy of the syllabus, a copy of the schedule. Um, it talks about how to submit things. Um, and whatever uh, software we're using in that class, so this is my 314, they use ma my math lab, they do a browser check, and then we go through and we have them actually get into the stuff that very first day of class. Um, and so they get a good sense of whether or not they can get you know, can work with stuff. Um, and again, part of those instructor appointments that students can set up is if you are having any troubles, and I tell them this all the time, every email that goes out says, and if you're having any issues, please contact me, please email me, please phone me, because um, if they can't understand the technology, they're not gonna do well in the class. And so usually by the second week of class, almost all my students have, figured it out. They figured out how to submit things, how to access things. Um, the technology does not seem to be a problem there. And final question. I know we're a little over, but we really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, we had a couple, a couple questions on um, LaTeX and if you need to know that in order to implement Gradescope in um, a 
the classroom? No. <laughs> so the short answer is no. Um, if you want to type the mathematical symbols in their form, so if you're using integrals or derivatives or things like that, um, they actually have a, you know, a quick, um, what do you call it, a quick guide that says, here's the simple things you need. I honestly, I think I know four things, I mean, I use LaTeX a lot, but I only use four things when I'm grading in LaTeX, uh, in, in uh, grade scope. Um, you don't have to use it. Uh, I can use the fraction symbol and put a fraction in there with a 2-3 and students will understand that perfectly fine. Um, I would say if you're going into those higher level classes where there are symbols, like actual math symbols you want to use, like integration or things like that, then I would say look at that guide and at least use those, those little ones. But no, you don't have to know LaTeX for it. Okay, well, we are officially out of time. Dr. Bowman, thank you so much for the amazing information today. We really hope that we're able to provide some resources um, for you other instructors out there who are transitioning online to help make your courses easier. If you need to email us or you have any questions, you can reach us at marketing at hawkslearning.com and we will be sending out a recording of this presentation along with a webinar certificate tomorrow for all of you who attended today. So thank you again for the great Q&A and we appreciate everyone attending. Thank you guys.